still in the same vein of acute gastroenteritis, we're moving from down below to up top. So now we're talking about vomiting here. Um, and so I'll be uh, presenting a paper and doing critical appraisal uh, on the paper entitled Antiemetics for Reducing Vomiting Related to Acute Gastroenteritis in Children and Adolescents. So why, do, why is this study even done? Well, in, in pediatric emergency room, the uh, presentation of acute gastroenteritis is not an uncommon uh, presentation, and the vomiting associated with that may even uh, produce so much dehydration that IV fluid might even be required. Instituting an antiemetic therapy to reduce the IV fluid rehydration may limit hospitalization and may even help to halt the disease course uh, and limit the vomiting and allow quicker resumption of oral rehydration, which allows dis disposition of these kids so that they can um, rehydrate back at home. So the objective of this study was to provide evidence for antiemetics in the setting of acute gastroenteritis, provide evidence for the cessation of vomiting, to reduce IV fluid rehydration, to reduce rates of hospitalization, and uh, quicker resumption of oral rehydration, and also parental satisfaction. Now, throughout, these, throughout this presentation, I'm going to be going through some questions that help us to critically appraise this uh, systematic review and meta-analysis. And so the first question is, is this a sensible clinical question? And I do believe uh, that it is. It does include some clinician or clinically important outcomes, but also some patient important outcomes. In terms of methodology, they only included RCTs. And the inclusion criteria was quite broad. So obviously, they defined a pediatric population younger than 18 years old. And anyone, any study that included vomiting due to a clinical diagnosis of gastroenteritis, those were the studies that were included. In terms of exclusion criteria, any organic cause from a surgical, infectious, or metabolic condition was uh, excluded. And vomiting from any atrogenic source in terms of uh, drugs from anesthesia or chemotherapy was also excluded. So again, in terms of our systematic, uh, sorry, critical appraisal, is this an appropriate eligibility criteria? I believe that it is. I think the uh, inclusion criteria is quite broad and exclusion criteria uh, are quite valid uh, to uh, reduce on confounders. In terms of their identification of articles, they provided quite a detailed description of how they um, searched through the electronic databases to find their studies. They looked in the Cochrane database, Medline, and Embase, and they used medical subject headings and text word searches, and they gave pages and reams of, and to describe their, uh, uh, their mesh and text word searches. Um, so it was quite detailed. They also looked at, uh, they hand searched some reference list to find other studies that they could look at and uh, didn't um, discriminate in language or date of uh, publication or anything like that. So in terms of an exhaustive and detailed search, I do believe that, that they did do that. Um, and this is how they uh, came up with their studies. The number of studies from the databases are listed there. They remove uh, the duplicate studies and we're left with 144 records. They looked at the inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria and uh, we're left with uh, 24 records to just be screened. And they further removed 12 more after they screened them and then we're left with 12 studies to actually be assessed full text. Those were looked into full text and excluded another five. Um, two were excluded because of, uh, they were awaiting classification on their methodological quality. One was a systematic review, and two others because of the, um, they, they, they didn't report on a primary or secondary outcome that they had to find a priori. So we're left with seven records, and of these seven records, um, three of them uh, were appropriate for quantitative synthesis, for, so for meta-analysis. So they laid out their, their search strategy and they laid out uh, how they assessed these papers. So I think it's a reproducible uh, selection. So from a critical appraisal standpoint, still getting good marks for methodology here. Then they followed and extracted the details from each study. Um, participant uh, demographics, allocation blinding, how they did the study, uh, their intervention, of course, and adverse effects. They then assessed the risk risk of bias in each of these uh, categories here in their randomization and their allocation concealment um, and uh, you know, loss to follow up and things of that nature. They also described how they uh, assess for heterogeneity as we had a lengthy discussion 
their I squared uh, value here was greater than 60, which is a more stringent measure than the 75. Um, and uh, they based everything on the Cochrane criteria when they were going through. Looking at this, their data synthesis when they were going through meta-analysis, they used a fixed effect model for, um, for bringing their data together, which is a less robust way uh, to do that. Basically, the fixed effect model assumes that the effect size is constant no matter where you do your study. Whether you do it in Timbuktu or you do it in Toronto, the effect size of your intervention is going to be the same. Usually when data synthesis, data synthesis is done, it's usually using a random effects model, which takes into account and says, depending on your population, your true effect size can actually change from population to population. And it says that variables outside of the study can affect your true effect size. So what can we take from here? Well, basically it just says our confidence in the effect size that we get from these studies, we have to take with a grain of salt, basically. Article uh, assessments were done by two independent authors, and they, as I said, they followed the Cochrane database, uh, sorry, the Cochrane uh, handbook. So I do think that they were reproducible assessments uh, in that regard. Uh, so still continuing on with high methodological quality. Let's get into the, the studies. There weren't 63 studies this time. There were seven studies included. Uh, they were all RCTs published from 1997 to 2010. And um, we did have uh, some studies from USA and, and from uh, Canada. And there's about 1,000 kids that were inclu included. These were the interventions. Four studies looked at PO on Danzatron versus placebo. One study looked at IV on Danzatron versus IV Maxtran or placebo. Another study looked at IV on Danzatron again, but looked at it versus IV DEX or placebo. And one study looked at uh, PR diamond hydronate versus placebo. Unfortunately, the primary outcome was only looked at by one study, and the secondary outcomes were addressed in part by the, uh, the other six. Now here's where things get a little uh, hairy. Up to 10 to 15% loss to follow-up in these studies. And as we get into risk of bias, we do see that over 50% of the studies had some issue, high-risk issue, with attrition bias, so loss to follow-up. And over 50% had issues with other bias. And this other bias um, are things like defining a convenience sample in, for enrollment in the study, but not defining what that convenience sample is. Subjects, uh, you know, randomizing error, but not being followed up accordingly. And that's what the other bias was, uh, it was um, uh, including. Here's another way to look at that table. In the rows, you see the, um, you see the studies that were included, and in the columns, the uh, types of bias. The red marks are the ones that are high risk of bias. The yellow is um, unclear risk, and the green is obviously good methodological quality. The ones I'm highlighting here are the three that are used for meta-analysis. So these are the three studies that they pooled data from. You can see that one of them is definitely a high-risk study on its own, and the other two are of unclear risk. So in terms of our critical appraisal then, I think the next question that you gotta ask are, were these of high methodological quality, the included studies? And I'd say definitely not. So what does that mean for our results? Well, let's just go through our results quickly here. Um, there's quite a few of them, but uh, what I'll do as I present, I'll, I'll present to you the summary, um, the summary of findings table here, which shows the, the grade value um, uh, if there is a meta-analysis done, and I'll give you the force plot if that was done. Um, the grade value, for those that aren't too familiar, basically defines how confident we can be that the, uh, the effect size that was found in the, um, the body of evidence accurately um, estimates the true quantity that you're looking for. So here we're taking, we're taking looking at uh, time to cessation of vomiting. Only the PR diamond hydrogen uh, study looked at this. There was no meta-analysis. When we look at the actual evidence here, we do see a significant reduction uh, in time to cessation of vomiting. However, this was a high-risk study. So unfortunately, I don't think I would be comfortable making any uh, conclusions from this. Looking at the rate of admission during ED stay, this is the PO on Danzatron, on Danzatron group. We do see a significant 60% reduction in rate of admission during their initial uh, ED visit. The grading system we found was they found was moderate. So what this means is 
from what I take from it is that we do see a trend to a decreased rate of admission. However, because the grade is only a moderate grade, and depending on the level of evidence that they were based on, the actual effect size, I don't think we can be confident that it's going to be 60%. It may, in f further study, will likely impact our confidence on that uh, true effect size. The rate of emission was found, was uh, looked at with the PR diamond hydronate and also the IV on Danzatron groups, but there was no significant uh, difference in the diamond hydronate. And IV on Danzatron did find a significant 97% reduction, but again, unfortunately, these were high risk studies, both of them, and so no, no conclusions uh, could be made. In terms of uh, rate of admission, <coughs> after 72 hours after discharge, um, in these cases, there was a uh, non-significant 40% reduction, and the grade was low. So that basically means that further study is very likely to impact our confidence, and so I don't think any real um, uh, conclusions could be made from that. These were done in a, um, a best to worst case scenario because it was unclear uh, in one of the studies how many patients were actually admitted initially and how many were actually ad uh, admitted 72 hours after discharge, so they did a best to worst case uh, uh, analysis, but both of them were both low grade, uh, and so no real uh, evidence could be garnered from there. Or conclusion, sorry. Rate of admission, uh, sorry, rate of IV hydration during ED stay, there was a 59% reduction, and it was a moderate grade of evidence, so again, I think we can say that there was um, uh, definitely a trend to uh, re reduced rate of IV hydration during the ED uh, initial visit, but the true effect size we can't really take away, uh, or it can't be too confident until, until we do further study. I'll just go through the rate of IV hydration. Again, this was a uh, best worst case scenario analysis, and uh, they did find a significant reduction. However, they were low grade again in terms of, uh, uh, sorry, the grade, uh, the grade was low, and so uh, no real uh, conclusions could be taken from there. And in terms of proportion of patients with cessation of vomiting, this is an interesting one. There was a 33% increase in uh, proportion of patients that, uh, uh, that halted their vomiting with the PO on Danzatron, and this one was uh, a moderate grade as well. So I, I think we can take that trend, uh, we can conclude that that trend is, is still there. Um, but again, the, uh, the effect size uh, may change, will likely change with further study. A few other studies looked at the proportion of patients uh, with cessation of vomiting. Um, the IV on Danzatron group did find a significant increase uh, in one study. Another study showed no increase, and the PR diamond hydronate showed a significant increase, but again, all these were high-risk studies, and so no conclusions could be made. Revisit rate non-significant, low grade, can't make any conclusions from there. Adverse, adverse events, they, they narratively said that diarrhea was seen in more patients uh, with their uh, anti-emetic therapy, although they didn't truly quantify that. So um, you can take what you want from a narrative um, uh, synthesis. Tolerance of uh, oral rehydration therapy, it was shown significant at two hours, but non-significant at, at four hours for the IV on Danzatron group. And the PO on Danzatron, one study uh, reported this outcome and they showed no significant difference. These are all high-risk studies with no conclusions that could be made. Parental satisfaction, there's no difference in the PR uh, gravel group, high-risk study. Again, sorry, we can't make any conclusions. So after going through all those, all those um, uh, outcomes, what's, what can we take away from this study? Well, I, reading through this, I found that the systematic review and the meta-analysis was done quite well. I think the methodology, the, the, the methods that they used uh, were well laid out, but the base evidence that it was based on um, was of poor methodological quality, so therefore, the, it's basically a garbage in, garbage out kind of situation. But I think that, you know, you were sitting, sitting here listening to me, so what can we truly take away from this? Well. Unfortunately, I don't think we can take anything away from time of cessation of vomiting, but we can say that there is a, um, a trend to decrease rate of admission during initial ED visit with PO on Danzatron. 
However, the effect size is yet to be seen, the true effect size. Again, rate of admission after 72 hours. Uh, can't make any conclusions there. However, we do see a decreased rate of IV hydration during the initial ED visit with PO and Danzitron. Uh, rate of IV hydration 72 hours after. Can't make any conclusions there. We do see an increase uh, in proportion of patients with cessation of vomiting with PO on Danzitron. Um, again, the effect size is still to be uh, delineated. And revisit rate, adverse events, and tolerance of oral rehydration therapy. Um, unfortunately, I uh, can't make any conclusions. Now, in terms of our clinical practice, after rotating through uh, pediatric eMERGE, with uh, a lot of clinical di clinically diagnosed uh, gastroenteritis, I've seen PO on Danzitron being used already with quite regularity. And looking at this study, I don't see any evidence that would strongly deter or strongly support that use. So in, I don't think it would change current practice right now. Um, and so um, that's what I got from this study. Thanks for listening. Any questions you have? You know, as usual, I don't think we ever see evidence of the quality we would like, unless it's research done at Western. But, but other than that, <laughs> you know, the, uh, like the Friedman study in particular at, at, um, done at SickKids in Toronto was a pretty high quality study, it was a New England Journal study, and really was almost instrumental in, in leading to this practice where I think uh, in Peds Emerge they hand out on Danzatron in the winter along with a sticker at triage to every right. child who registers, you know. So, I mean, and so there's been a dramatic shift in practice. And I think if you speak to the clinicians, there has been uh, at least a sense that goes along with the literature which supports giving PO on Danzatron to kids. And, and really, I mean, I, I we, you say in garbage in and garbage out, but I think, like I said, in, in particular, I know that, that Friedman study was a pretty high quality study, actually, uh, that they, they were able to establish benefit. I, I wondered if you... Yeah, the, the Friedman study, uh, as we can see here, the only problem that the authors had was that they had, they had stated that they were industry funded, but they didn't state at, to what level they were industry funded. So in terms of, in relative uh, to the other studies, I think that was one of the better studies. And it was included in the meta-analysis. So the conclusions that they do have, I think we can take, uh, yeah, that we can take their trends uh, are there. But I don't think that because of that methodological problem, we can say that the, uh, the true effect size is, or, or can, we can take for sure that what they found is the true effect size. I guess at the end of the day, as clinicians, we want to know would we give this therapy or not based on the available evidence? So after reviewing this, would you give PO on Danstron to a puking kid? Uh, I think I would, um, based on, if you're, if you're looking at all of this evidence, uh, if I'm looking to reduce uh, 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 admission at initial ED visit, reduce IV uh, rates, and um, increase the cessation of vomiting, if I'm looking to do that, then I would. What do our pediatric colleagues do or think about this topic? So we, based on the Friedman study, we've been giving PO on Danzatron, and that was a major study to sort of change the practice. And I mean, just anecdotally, I think it's made a huge difference from a parental perspective in terms of helping the parents rehydrate their children. And it also has, I mean, anecdotally, it seems like it's decreased length of stay in the ED as well. So it gives them that sort of eight hour window to sort of get on top of stuff. So, um, and I think it's definitely helped decrease the need for IV rehydration. So, but again, this is all from what I've seen in a few years compared to even what it was before the Friedman study came out. This may be a dangerous question. Um, is there any move toward um, or has anybody heard of any move toward providing on Dancitron as an over-the-counter, um, you know, over-the-counter medication for parents to pick up for their for their children? Similar to you know, they can pick up Grav all over the counter, and if on Dancitron has so much efficacy, you know, are, are, why aren't we providing it for for parents to buy at home if if the adverse effects and everything are not severe? I don't know if anyone's heard of it. Or no. Like, okay. Submit your application to Health Canada. 
I think if you were to look at, I think that's a great question, if you were to look at the adverse effect profile of Dantron, which is basically just diarrhea, worsening versus, and, and I guess the other big adverse effect profile you have to think about about Dantron is we're so quick to give on Dantron to the vomiting child now that occasionally you can miss uh, other, you know, not everything that vomits is a gastro, so you can miss other pathology. I would say those are the two biggest adverse events that you would think are associated with on Dantron. It's masking some other more serious illness and then the diarrhea uh, is associated. So, you know, having said that, mm -hmm. Gravol has more adverse events and is available over the counter. So, I think if you were going to introduce both products now, it would probably be on Danstron that would be approved by Health Canada for over the counter use. It's a good question. I don't know how that process develops, but that, that's a very good question. It would certainly probably help overall. I don't, would you guys support it if Health Canada came and asked you guys, uh, should on Danstron be available PO for kids over the counter? Would you guys support that? I would support it over gravel. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, again, you run the risk of masking, like you said, something that's really significant. So we never, like, I mean, I personally don't give a second or third dose of a dance trying to go home. Because right. then that's the way I tell them, even though parents really want it. And I said, you know, because I want to know if your child's going to be vomiting. That is, you know, you know, one loose stool plus multiple episodes of vomiting. Is that really gastroenteritis? I don't know. So you want to know clinically what they do in the next few days. I, I think some, some of us, will prescribe to a reliable, intelligent set of parents, you know, you can get these quick dissolve tablets. So, you know, I think you gauge the parental level of comfort and their reliability in bringing the child back. Because, you know, a lot of kids will throw up for 12 hours or 24 hours, but really masking that severe illness or something, you know, some of the is the biggest concern I would have. That happens I, to the I guess the question really is, Evan, that, and we say that it may mask other causes of vomiting. I just don't know if there's any literature that really support that. No, I, I see, agree. Because I if you've got a brain tumor, you're, you, you know, uh, and it's a significant brain tumor, you're going to vomit because of ICP. And I don't think we have somebody who has a brain tumor, we give them gravel, they stop vomiting. And I know that when we've given a Dancitron to those kids, they feel a little bit better, but they don't stop vomiting. I think somebody who has a bowel obstruction, they're not going to stop vomiting because that's a, that's a mechanical effect. So I think that that assumption that we're going to mask serious disease, we may mask somebody with a UTI who's vomiting, right? Okay, that's fine because it, it may be, but I'm not sure that we're serious disease. I'm not really sure that's the case. And I think it's one of those things that we just draw that conclusion as a, uh, as a safeguard that we don't want to, you know, we've had this discussion, for example, of making this a medical directive so the kids will get their adults ton of triage. And there's a lot of angst among some members of our group about that particular medical directive because they're concerned about that very fact but I don't think there's any evidence to say whether it's true or not true. Yeah I would support personally I would support that kind of medical directive I think the concern is things like appendicitis um, you know these kinds of illnesses which are non-specific it could potentially delay care if you're handing out three doses to go home with I, I agree it's a theoretical concern and it's really there's a lot of other factors. I, I think we're. I think we're. It's a good symptom management tool, and I think that Friedman study in particular proves that, and it's worth giving. And, and I don't think many of us give more than. I mean, some may give a second dose to go home. They usually just get the preliminary dose, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And that seems to. I mean, anecdotally again. And you use the IV simple. solution, just PO, right? Is that how you guys we have get the, it? No, we use dissolvable tablets, though. Or the quick dissolved the quick tablet. tablet. But the quick dissolved tablets are very expensive. That's the problem. The new generic one is less expensive. There's a oh, generic. There's a generic. Yeah. That's why we went to the, uh, to the tablet. Is that new? Yeah. Gary, what, what in your mind is the difference between <laughs> giving ondansetron and triage versus giving Tylenol and triage and ablating the fever? To me, there isn't. I, 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 think, I think we should. In fact, there are many centers in the U.S. as well as some centers in Canada following the Freedom Study who do that. Uh, they have uh, they have shorter wait times for those patients because they start as soon as they have the Danstron, they've already started their hydration in the waiting room. Especially if you have long waits, like cities like Calgary and uh, and some of the big U.S. centers. And, and to, I mean, from what I've heard from these individuals, uh, it, it really expedites the patient's care. I think you know the, the 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 concern that people have spoken about is that they stop vomiting, they leave, and you miss the appendicitis or you miss the more significant pathology. I don't know if that's really the case, because I, th I think that that picture's a little different. Well, is it possible to put a, a safeguard in place? I mean, it wouldn't work 100% of the time, but where you actually say to the parents, you know, if you feel that your child is better, 
while you've been sitting here, please just come and uh, let us know that you're leaving. And then they, at least the nurse could reassess the patient and check the vital signs again and, you know. Reassure. Yeah, I, I, uh, I don't have, I mean, I don't, even if they, they left, those diseases will come back, um, right? The ones, yeah. are the, the, ones, the ones that you worry about are the appendicitis, which comes back as a perf now versus an early appendix. So, so I mean, uh, I, I think we've had uh, discussion. There's, we, Calgary has a, a protocol they've been using for well over a year now probably two years since the Friedman study, and I, I, I don't, I've not heard any adverse events from them. We, you know, it's a small community. We know there's major misses and people will be removing their protocols. Um, I think it's just an inherent um, willingness of the group to take that next step, you know. And, um, you know, so so some go home and you could easily say, you see the triage nurse. The issue is around triaging, as you know, the nurse may or may not have time to reassess them or they may not go and there's a bunch of more reason to have the nurse or the some sort of practitioner available to call the patients the right. next day. I agree. Yeah. So we have no money, that's not going to happen. <laughs> what do you think, Naveen? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I don't, I don't know that there's much evidence that we're going to miss big, bad stuff. That I, I mean, I tend not to give it to them when they can, well, on their way out the door because, you know, what did we do before on Dacitron, right? We, we told them how to hydrate, even if you're vomiting, you hydrate a certain amount. If you take a small enough amount, it'll stay in. I think that there's always a problem, I mean, especially like for people that just finished, like myself, you know, you, I mean, you tend to go after the most common thing and you get this tunnel vision. Well, not only have I diagnosed this person with gastro, but I've cured them, therefore they must have gastro, right? So, in that way, I think it's a little bit tricky to send someone home with, with that. But I'm sure, you know, very shortly, I think there's a study our Friedman and his group are probably working on something right now where they're um, sending kids home with, uh, on dance and trauma and they're looking at the efficacy of that. Do you guys have um, fairly detailed discharge instructions pre-printed for uh, diarrheal or diarrheal? Yes, we do, and they they're actually probably need to be updated. They're fairly old. Uh, are I think what, in general, not just with this yeah. particular illness, but I think our discharge instructions uh, many places have linked into, you know, you make the diagnosis and the list of discharge instruction pops up and you push the button and you click and it prints it out. Um, we used to have, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 different discharge instruction sheets, but that's kind of seemed to go, gone by the by. Um, yeah, I think I, it's kind of haphazard what we're telling patients to be honest. I agree with you, John. I think part of the difficulty is we don't have an EPR in the eMERGE uh, for various reasons, and I think electronic like patient record. Sorry? EPR, electronic patient record. Oh, EPR, sorry, I missed the E. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Going down. Uh, and if we did, then obviously when you populated your discharge diagnosis field, that could automatically lead to a, to a summary sheet being generated, generated. That, that you could do. You know, the, we do have several sheets in the eMERGE, everything from temperature control, and there's a bunch of other ones. I think, you know, one of the great difficulties, when I look at some of these sheets, I don't think they're very well founded in what evidence we've had because they're old, so somebody would have to take those sheets rework them all, decide which ones really do fit with our current state of knowledge, which may change again tomorrow, and then reissue in parrots, uh, you know, including stuff, you know, if you just take today's discussion, whether or not probiotics work or work, I mean, that's nowhere on the gastroenteritis issue. Whether it should or shouldn't be is a different issue, but you know, those kind of common sense or potential common sense uh, remedies. Maybe we should have a small, set up a small working group of, uh, of docs to actually just deal with this issue of discharge instruction sheets? I think that'd be great. And you know, the, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics, I think on their website, uh, actually has a list of what they've, uh, evidence-based, whatever evidence-based is, guidelines and discharge summaries that you can actually print. And they come in multi-languages, predominantly English, Spanish, and a couple of other ones that are common to the US. Uh, they may not fit with our Somalian population or Middle Eastern population, but. Uh,